Welcome back to Item Not Found, Accounting for Loss in Libraries, Archives, and Other Heritage and Memory Organizations. The Center for 17th and 18th Century Studies and Clark Library acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tavangar. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Hanuk Vatam, Ahihirom, and Iohinkum, past, present, and emerging. Oakland University resides on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, known as the Three Fires Confederacy, comprised of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. The land was ceded in the 1807 Treaty of Detroit and makes up Southeast Michigan. In recognizing the history and respecting the sovereignty of Michigan's Indian nations, Oakland University honors the heritage of indigenous communities and their significant role in shaping the course of this region. Further, we recognize the wrongs done to those forcibly removed from their homelands and commit to fostering an environment of inclusion that is responsive to the needs of First Peoples through our words, policies, and actions. The preservation and perpetuation of customs and traditions of indigenous nations are essential to our shared cultural heritage. A deep understanding of native people's past and present informs the teaching, research, and community engagement of the university in its ongoing effect, effort to elevate the dignity of all people and serve as shared stewards of the land. Welcome again to the second and final day of Item Not Found, Accounting for Loss in Libraries, Archives, and Other Heritage and Memory Organizations. From the William Andrews Clark Memorial Library at UCLA, we are Anna Chen, Head Librarian, Rebecca Fenning Marshall, Manuscript and Archives Librarian, and Nina Schneider, Rare Books Librarian. From Oakland University's Kresge Library in Rochester, Michigan, we are Molly McGuire, Digital Strategies Librarian, and Emily Spoonagle, Rare Books Librarian. Before we get started, just a few quick best practices for the conference. Um, we're excited about using this conference to foster generative dialogue on topics that might not be easy to chat about in our daily spaces. Please feel free to share your thoughts and reactions in the chat. If you have a question for the speakers, please try to put those in the Q&A feature. We'll monitor both the chat and the Q&A, but your questions will be easier for us to see when they're in the Q&A. Um, you can also follow the conversation on social media at hashtag lost slam. That's hashtag loss LAM. We also want to remind everyone of our code of conduct uh, in order to provide a mutually respectful conference environment, harassing, discriminatory, and demeaning conduct is prohibited. We reserve the right to take appropriate action, including removal from the conference in response to unacceptable conduct. To learn more about the origins of this conference and what brings us together today, uh, we encouraged you to watch the recording of our welcome remarks yesterday, if you weren't able to catch it yesterday, um, which will be posted on the Clark Library's YouTube channel in the near future, where we will also post the keynotes. We're also exploring what other portions of the conference will be able to publish, and um, if you registered for the conference, we'll be happy to send you an update about this. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speakers, TK Sangwan and Gabriel Solis, who will make who will be in conversation um, on the topic of limits and loss, reflections on a decade of post-custodial praxis. TK Sangwan is a certified archivist, librarian, and DJ who specializes in building preservation partnerships for human rights documentation and cultural heritage materials, particularly in Latin America and the US. She is both a Fulbright specialist and scholar, as well as a resident DJ at the LA-based radio station DubLab, where she hosts her monthly program, The Archive of Feelings. Gabriel Solis um, is the director of the Texas After Violence, Texas After Violence Project, um, and prior to returning there as executive director in 2016, he worked as a capital post-conviction investigator for the Office of Capital and Forensic Writs, criminal justice researcher at the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law, and helped lead the Guantanamo Bay Oral History Project at the Columbia Center for Oral History Research. Gabriel has also served as an advisor for the Ford Foundation's Reclaiming the Border Narrative Initiative, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund Oral History Project, and the UCLA Archiving in the Age of Mass Incarceration Project. Gabriel is also currently serving as a fellowship mentor for Fanny Garcia's Separated, 
a national endowment for the humanities supported project documenting the lived experiences of parents separated from their children at the US-Mexico border under the zero tolerance policy in 2018. Gabrielle is also the recipient of the 2018 Pushcart Prize for Nonfiction. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for being here today. And now I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the intros, Becky. Um, hi, everyone. Good, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. Thanks so much for joining today. Shout out to everyone who's joining us on the YouTube live stream as well. And I want to give a big thanks to Anna and Emily for the invitation to be here, as well as to all the folks at Clark Library, Oakland University Libraries, who made this event possible. I know conference logistics on Zoom can be just as complicated as real live conferences. So thanks to everyone who has made this go smoothly. Um, before I get into the conversation with Gabriel, I want to give you a little bit more context of who I am and why I'm talking today. Uh, as Rebecca mentioned, I'm TK Sangwon and I'm a librarian at the UCLA Digital Library Program. And over the past 14 years, I've worked within US academic libraries to build ethical transnational post custodial partnerships um, in the US, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And it was through my work as a human rights archivist for the Human Rights Documentation Initiative at UT Austin um, that I met Gabriel. Uh, back then in 2009, I had just facilitated a post-custodial partnership between UT Austin and the human rights organization Sex After Violence Project. And back then, Gabe was just in his first year of his MA program in Mexican American Studies, but was also a paid contractor at TAVP. Um, so it's really amazing to see how he's come back to lead TAVP and how much it's grown under his leadership. Uh, Gabe, you've really taken the organization from one that focuses solely on community-based oral histories to an organization that's really become a model in how to engage in doing community-based memory work and how to archive it ethically, um, in addition to creatively engaging the public on these complex questions of justice, violence, and accountability, and also advocating for abolition and transformative justice. So. Um, since we've both been working within these post-custodial spaces for the past decade, I wanted to have a conversation that reflects on what has worked well in these partnerships, but also um, what some of the challenges have been and what the implications of those challenges are for archival loss. So Gabe, thank you so much for joining me in this conversation today. Um, before going any further though, I want to define a key term that we'll be referencing throughout the conversation, and that term is post-custodial archiving. Uh, the Society of American Archivists defines it post-custodial archiving as a practice in which archivists no longer physically acquire and maintain records, but will provide management oversight for records that remain in the custody of record creators. And archivists initially developed this concept in the early 80s in response to the custody issues that emerged with the proliferation of digital records and the impossibility of archival institutions being able to acquire and preserve them all. So while there is no one singular way to do post-custodial archiving, Gabe and I will be discussing a post-custodial model in which a large academic university library partners with a human rights organization to um, preserve long-term the documentation, the digital documentation of that organization. And in this partnership model, the large university library also shares preservation expertise and training so that the organization can also build their internal preservation capacity. So over the past 15 years, archivists have discussed and implemented uh, this model of post-custodial archiving as an ethical response to traditional archival practices that tend to extract important archival documentation from their communities of origin, particularly from marginalized US communities and also from global South communities. And these extractive practices, which are colonial in origin, severely limit communities' access to the historical memory. And so in contrast, post-custodial archiving can enable the long-term preservation of histories that may otherwise be lost. And post-custodial archiving can also facilitate the conditions for more community agency and control over their own histories. So since 2009, um, in my roles as human rights archivist at UT Austin and as librarian for digital co collection development, at the Digital Library Program, I've facilitated these post-custodial partnerships with human rights organizations and cultural heritage organizations around the world. 
And when Anna approached me to speak on these decolonial post-custodial archiving practices at this conference, um, I knew I didn't want to give a typical talk um, that primarily focuses on the virtues of doing post-custodial archiving. I've given a lot of talks and written extensively about this topic. And honestly, since the pandemic, a lot of my post-custodial work has been on pause. And so it didn't feel quite right to talk about this pre-pandemic work in this pandemic context. So. Um, I thought that it would be really beneficial to reflect on what we've learned over the past decade and the challenges that we've encountered. Um, and since I'm someone who's only worked in large academic libraries, I thought it'd be really important and necessary to have this conversation with someone who's also intimately familiar with post-custodial archiving, but is without, but is outside the university. So that's why I invited Gabe to join me in this conversation. And I'm hoping we can have a frank conversation about post-custodial archiving and what it's accomplished, but also its limitations and the implications of these limitations for archival loss. So Gabe, thank you so much for being here today. Um, will you share a little bit more about yourself and the work of the Texas After Violence Project? Yes, of course, thank you TK and thank you to the organizers of this event. Uh, as you mentioned, we met back in 2009, I believe, after I'd been with uh, TAVP uh, for two years at that point, and at that time, as you mentioned, we were documenting oral histories related to loss, murder, and the death penalty. Those two years, I was a young person. I was in my early 20s. Um, those two years were very formative for me, and they changed my entire worldview about violence and justice. After graduate school, I went to work with Mary Marshall Clark at Columbia at the Center for Oral History Research. As they mentioned, I worked on the Guantanamo Bay Oral History Project where we documented and archived testimonies about some of the most horrific aspects of the so-called post-9-11 global war on terror. We interviewed many people with a wide range of experiences and perspectives from former detainees who were abused and tortured at the Guantanamo Bay prison camp, Agron, and CIA black sites, all the way to a former U.S. Supreme Court justice who wrote key decisions about the legal rights of people who were captured as enemy combatants during the U.S. war against the Taliban in Afghanistan and Pakistan. When I returned to Texas in 2013, I went to work as a capital post-conviction investigator on behalf of people that were sentenced to death. My job was to build trust uh, with our clients and their loved ones in order to reconstruct their life and social histories. And while these histories often centered on violence and abuse that our clients suffered throughout their lives, our challenge was really to show the judges um, when post-conviction appeal, it's the judges that you're trying to convince. So our job was really to show the judges that our clients were loved and loved other people. That basic humanization was meant to counter the dehumanizing strategy of trial prosecutors um, that, that often are effective in getting ordinary people uh, to vote in favor of an execution. Anyone who's done community oral history work will, will know, will understand how that oral history work I think made me a pretty effective investigator. It taught me how to deeply listen with compassion, understanding, and without judgment. In 2015, TVP's board of directors asked me to come back as its executive director. Um, I was reluctant at first because I had never um, had a role like that. Uh, but when I came back, I pretty quickly expanded the mission scope to document the impacts of state violence broadly, initiating new documentation and archival projects on police violence, mass incarceration, and in-custody deaths in ways that center agency, humanity, and dignity. By inviting directly impacted people and communities to make key decisions about project design, implementation, and objectives, our work builds power to, dom to counter dominant narratives about violence and accountability, and to contribute to broader narratives, excuse me, to broader movements uh, to dismantle the carceral state. In recent years, TVB has experienced really um, a lot of growth and we've implemented new, uh, innovative and impactful projects and programs from our Visions After Violence Community Fellowship Program and Artists and Writer Residencies to our Virtual Belonging Research Project with our friends at the South Asian American Digital Archives and the UCLA Community Archives Lab. Um, on the, uh, that project is on the effective impacts of contributing to community archives. And uh, also our Access to Treatment Initiative, which actually trains mental health clinicians across the United States to better serve the loved ones of those who've been executed or sentenced to death. And I wanted to be sure to mention that last one because I think it shows that community archives often do a lot more than just preserve materials. Their work often directly contributes to fighting for healing and justice and liberation. 
TVP also continues to be a critical resource for our allies. And we create resources responsive to our community needs and to new and ongoing crises. Um, some examples of this are resources that we've created and are updating on mitigating risks of legal, legal exposure and retaliation to the communities we serve and responsibly documenting and archiving audiovisual protest materials. The, those last ones we did with our friends at Witness. So um, that's just a sort of a fraction of what we're working on right now. Yeah, I'm always so blown away by the breadth of work that TAVP does, and I really wish we could have a more in-depth conversation about some of these initiatives that y'all are working on. But um, since we don't have time to do that today, I highly encourage everyone to go to the TAVP website and learn more about the breadth of their work. Um, so Gabe, to get into the topic of today, um, can you tell a little bit more about why Texas After Violence Project decided to enter into a post-custodial partnership with UT Austin and what you've seen the impact of that partnership um, for TAVP's work over the past decade? Okay, so we initially entered the partnership um, with UTHRDI out of necessity. At that time, we were a very young organization. We had very little funding. I think there's probably only one staff person at that time and a group of contractors. I was, I was a, a contractor um, just out of college. Um, and our focus, as I said, really was on documentation. So we were driving around the state with our little camera and um, sitting in people's living rooms and bearing witness to um, really uh, difficult stories of loss and survival. And so in many ways, that post custodial arrangement uh, was perfect for us at that time. It eased our anxieties knowing that highly skilled archivists like the UTK were stewarding the important stories we were documenting and other materials we were collecting, such as case records, photographs, uh, home videos, um, and other ephemera. Um, besides the technical assistance that we needed at that time um, through the post-custodial partnership, it also allowed our collection to be in dialogue with other human rights collections from around the world. And in a, in a symbolic way, that countered notions of US exceptionalism when it came to human rights in a criminal punishment system that's based on revenge and retribution. Uh, more directly, it also allowed us to find community with other projects with similar documentation and archival missions. Um, so one big example of this is you advocated for TABP to be part of the 2018 Architect and Sustainable Futures Gathering in New Orleans that was organized by our friends Burgess, Jules, and John Voss. Um, and that event alone uh, allowed us to make connections with practitioners and groups <clears throat> that were um, that we are still very much working with today. <clears throat> And so it, it immediately gave us a community. I sort of thought we were alone in Texas doing this work and going to that gathering made me realize that there were many other groups that were doing uh, similar work. And um, <clears throat> so, like I said, I'm still working very closely with, with many of the people that I met there. It also allowed us to be introduced to some funders that were in the room. And we are still have funding partnerships with many of the people that are in that room as well. So. I can't overstate how important that was for our success and growth over the last decade. Um, and, and all of that emerged from this initial um, post-custodial partnership. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I just I mean, want to say that's amazing. Thank you for recapping and giving that history and showing the connections between um, that were forged between these different community archives at that time. I, I kind of like to think of that as like the golden age of this post-custodial <laughs> era. <laughs> it was, I mean, it, it set us on the trajectory that we're on. So that's that's important. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask you a question, TK. Uh, <laughs> so what impacts of post-custodial archiving have you seen broadly over the last decade? Hmm. So I think one of the biggest shifts that I witnessed is this complete shift in professional discourse and education around post-custodial archiving. Um, when I was in the UCLA MLIS program in 2006, there was no discussion of post-custodial practice as a viable archival method. And I think the work that we accomplished at UT Austin through the Human Rights Documentation Initiative really contributed to and shifted the discourse on post-custodial practices. And now, you know, we're seeing discussions, presentations, publications on the topic. Um, it's fairly mainstream in archival discourse and on syllabi within iSchools. 
Um, I think in tandem with the shift in discourse, we've also seen more institutional acceptance of post-custodial archiving. Um, as you mentioned, you know, there are funders such as Mellon Foundation, National Endowment for the Humanities, Ford Foundation, they're all funding post-custodial projects now. And of course, library administrators are likewise pursuing these funding opportunities. Um, and I know we'll get into the complexities of what that means um, with this mainstreamification of post-custodialism, but I do think it's really important to note this uh, shift in, in discourse because it is significant. Um, what I do think is really exciting about post-custodialism over the past decade is seeing the significant impact it's had for our community partners in terms of preserving materials that might up might not otherwise be preserved. Um, it's also helped to build and strengthen archival expertise and infrastructure within local communities. Um, as you mentioned, it's helped redistributed resources and increase funding opportunities. And we've also seen it strengthen historical memory locally and among diaspora communities. Um, so I'll just share a few examples of, of that impact just to give you and everyone else a sense of, of what that looks like. Um, so through a post-custodial partnership that the UCLA Library has with the Instituto de Historia de Cuba, or the National Institute of Cuban History, which is based in Havana, Cuba, we were able to digitize, preserve, and provide access to this unique collection of pre-revolutionary radio recordings that were recorded on 16-inch lacquer discs. And even within the US, the playback equipment necessary to digitize this material is very rare. And so it's completely impossible to source that type of equipment in Cuba. So without this post-custodial partnership, um, it's possible that these recordings would have deteriorated significantly and not being able to be digitized in the future. Um, I think another example of this post-custodial impact is through the HRDI's partnership with the Museo de la Palabra y la Imagen, or the Museum of the Word and Image based in El Salvador. Through this partnership, we were also able to digitize a collection of radio recordings, this time cassette tapes from Radio Venceremos, which broadcast throughout El Salvador during the Civil War. And many of these tapes were actually smuggled outside the country during the armed conflict and then brought back in after the peace accord. So they've already gone through a lot of transit and were um, in, in fragile conditions. So, you know, without this type of partnership, the tapes might not have been able to uh, be digitized in the future. Um, another really important uh, impact story that we have is through the HRDI's partnership with the Genocide Archive of Rwanda. Um, back in 2008, when we initiated that partnership, there was really no strong archival infrastructure in Rwanda, much less a digital archival infrastructure. And so due to the collaboration with UT Austin, the Genocide Archive of Rwanda was able to really build up its archival capacity and infrastructure. And it did so, so significantly that the office of the president in Rwanda actually contacted the Genocide Archive of Rwanda to conduct an assessment of his own presidential archives. And through that, um, UT Libraries was actually subcontracted by the Genocide Archive of Rwanda to support them in that assessment process. So, it's really through this post-custodial partnership that the community partner was able to gain the expertise to become um, archival leaders in their country. Um, so I give these examples to show how historical memory is also strengthened by preserving these archival materials and by building this expertise and capacity. Um, I think one of the most poignant examples I've seen of how significant this strengthening of historical memory is um, was through the early stages of a partnership that UT Libraries had with the Guatemala Police Archive. Um, and this collaboration between the institutions actually led to a, U, a UT graduate course uh, that was centered around the Guatemala Police Archive. And through the seminar, many of the students um, who were of the Guatemalan diaspora, um, they were really able to engage in the history of Guatemala's armed conflict by doing research in both the digital archive held at UT, but also um, at the physical archive in Guatemala City, they were able to take a field trip down there. And the students were uh, talking about how impactful it was uh, for them to be able to reconnect with this history because it had been silenced or hadn't been widely discussed within, within their families because of how painful it was. So I think reconnecting people to their histories and strengthening their relationship to it is really one of the most powerful impacts that post-custodial archiving can have. Um, and I think the last thing I just wanted to, to touch on is um, something that you already mentioned, is the impact of the redistribution of resources and funding opportunities. Um, I think UT Libraries 
tried to address this creatively. Um, we used acquisition budgets to compensate labor for post-custodial partnerships in exchange for digital archival materials. Um, you know, this wasn't a perfect solution and I'm sure it's not the only solution, but I think it exemplifies some of the creative thinking that we have to think of, that we have to employ in institutions to ensure that we're really um, trying to engage in these partnerships ethically. Um, and I think it's such an amazing example of how UT, uh, I'm sorry, of how TAVP has connected with funders like the Mellon um, to get your own funding because community partners shouldn't be reliant on large institutions to design grant funded projects. Um, they should be able to do that on their own terms and not be reliant on institutions. I'm glad you went through all of the collections that you were a part of there because I mean, it shows the point I was making earlier about having a collection focused on Texas and the US South around state violence and why that's important to have those collections sort of in dialogue with each other. Yep. Um, yeah, so, you know, now that we've talked uh, about the positive, the more positive impacts of post-custodial archiving and what's worked well, um, I wanted to ask you what you think some of the challenges of post-custodial archiving have been for TVP and what you think institutions can do better. So, as I mentioned, I, the partnership was really beneficial for us for several years, um, but there came a point when library staff at UT were no longer able to be responsive to our needs as they were in earlier years. Uh, you had already left UT by that point, and the archivists there told me that the reason behind this was that the initial grant funding that had supported the development of HRDI had been exhausted, and library administrators, for whatever reason, didn't uh, fill those funding gaps. Um, but I, I want to be clear about because I, I'm going to get into some of the problems here, but I want to be clear about the point that um, the, archive, the staff archivists and the iSchool graduate students that we worked with day to day at UT were not the problem. <laughs> uh, they worked really hard and they put in as much time as they could to try to meet our needs and the needs of our fast growing collection. They, it, it appears that they just simply were not given the, the resources that they needed to continue the post custodial standard that you had put into place TKYU you were there. Um, so this went on for a while, uh, a couple of years, there were some frustrations, um, but then a confluence of factors forced us to really, um, really step back from the post custodial partnership. Uh, first, because of the lack of resources, HRDI was still using an outdated platform that relied on Adobe Flash. Um, and that was discontinued in 2020. And when that happened, we were given no advance warning of that, even though I believe the um, uh, staff at UT may have known for several months that was going to happen. And much of what, what resulted was that much of our audiovisual collection was no longer uh, accessible. This immediately jeopardized our mission to build an archive that was first and foremost a resource for activists, organizers, advocates, educators, um, and, and our, our community more broadly. So that was a major problem. Um, second, because of these problems around inaccessibility, we secured funding from the Mellon Foundation to build our own autonomous digital repository using local tool. Uh, and this resulted in the launch of our After Violence Archive, uh, which I'm very proud of. And I want to note, uh, it's actually down for maintenance right now, but it'll be up in the next couple of days for anyone who wants to visit it. Third, it was becoming increasingly difficult for us to justify to ourselves a partnership with an institution that has been interti intertwined with white supremacy basically since its founding. Uh, there are many, many examples of this, but one recent example was in 2021 when the university uh, refused to take action um, and get rid of the school's fight zone, uh, which is called the University Texas. Uh, which was performed at student minstrel shows in the early 20th century. And today is still sung at football games. And I think they even play it over the, the tower um, sometimes, you know, a couple of times a day or something. Um, and the reason why the university didn't act on it, even though students of color were demanding action, is because uh, uh, wealthy donors threatened to pull their funding from the university because they, they wanted the school to fully embrace that fight song. Um, and, uh, you know, that was very revealing to us. And um, my colleague, Jane Field, my former colleague, Jane Field, um, she wrote a short essay about 
this whole problem and sort of our reaction to it. Um, and I think uh, the organizers placed it there in the chat if you want to learn more about it. Um, and then I would say, uh, you know, really the final straw for us was that when we learned that the university may have been raising money off of our collection uh, in the aftermath of the police killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor um, and the subsequent nationwide movement for Black Lives and racial justice. Um, uh, you know, we had never received any funding support from the university for being a post-facilial partner. Um, and so when I learned that, um, that was something that we couldn't quite get past. And so we decided to no longer send materials there and we continue to migrate our collection to our own digital repository. I'll say though that I think what happened there in the last couple of years um, in our stark difference from the way we were working together in the early years, TK, when you were there, and even, even a couple of years after you had left, um, I think that was a failure at the top. <clears throat> I think it was a failure by library administrators and by high-ranking university officials. I believe that if it were up to the staff archivists who we were working with day to day, then many of these problems would have been avoided or addressed. Um, <clears throat> but I want to be clear about the fact of the matter that we have to figure out a way to make these institutional partnerships functional. Um, we have to figure out a way uh, to make sure that they are effective and equitable and honest about serious harms, both past and present. Uh, and I would encourage anybody here who has not already read the Architect and Sustainable Futures report that was generated from that gathering in New Orleans to check it out. I think they also put in the chat. That report has very straightforward recommendations uh, for, um, for some of these, to make these institutional partnerships functional and equitable. There are people in the community archives world who believe that um, these partnerships can actually never fully be equitable. I think though that there may be some truth to that, but I also recognize the critical role that these post-custodial partnerships play for activists, organizers, and advocates that don't have the resources or the capacity or maybe even the interest uh, to preserve uh, community stories and other materials related to state violence and human rights. You know, their missions are usually centered around direct actions or campaigns, and um, uh, usually, unless they're from the archive, there's not so much of an emphasis on preservation and decisions around access. Uh, and so I think that, um, and so I think that, uh, <clears throat> and whether it's through the systematic erasure or calculated destruction of records, these stories and materials are forms of endangered knowledge that are always under the threat of being lost. And post-custodial partnerships have a huge potential to help limit this potentially massive loss. I want to make one more last point, um, and that is to say that Another reason why I think we have to figure out a way for these partnerships to work is that increasingly post-custodial partnerships need to play a role to help the communities they serve protect their collections, protect this endangered knowledge against threats, both old and new, from the usual threats from police and prosecutors or right-wing extremists to emerging threats such as the proliferation of mis- and disinformation online, and new threats of surveillance fueled by advances in artificial intelligence, just to name a few examples. I think post custodial partnerships can be extremely useful here. Yeah, thank you for sharing so openly about those frustrating experiences that you had, um, and frankly, unethical experiences that you had um, working with UT. Um, they're not entirely surprising, but they're certainly disturbing. Um, and they're also consistent with some of the trends that I've seen um, as well, working in these post-custodial spaces. Um, I'm also really glad that you touched on the, I wouldn't say tension necessarily, but the differences in opinion among community archive folks around, you know, whether to engage in post-custodial partnerships with large universities. Um, I think it's really important to highlight that not everyone in, in the community thinks the same way about it. And I think it's useful to talk about you know, different methods to address some of these issues. Yeah, I mean, there's the, oftentimes there are many, many generations of distrust between uh, large academic institutions and the communities um, that they are in. And so they're, they're just gonna take a lot of proactive work on behalf of, of people situated in these institutions to sort of try to um, overcome those barriers. So. Okay, so TK, what have been the challenges that you've seen over the last decade um, from where you're sitting in a large academic institution and what is your views on what 
um, these institutions can do better to make these partnerships work. Yeah, so there's a lot I can say about the challenges. Um, a few off the top of my head are this issue of compensation for community partners, um, being able to implement ethical non-extractive practices within partnerships, um, you know, the challenge of having sufficient staffing, particularly with the right technical expertise, as well as uh, cultural competency and linguistic expertise. Um, and then the challenge of the lack of sustainability planning after after grant funding ends, which you know you alluded to as well. Um, first, I'll say that institutional, like large university libraries, really shouldn't be pursuing this grant funding for community-based archival projects without actually involving members of the community that they intend to work with. I know this is very obvious, but it's worth stating because I've sat on review panels for grants programs such as NEH. IMLS, and it's very common for academic libraries to apply for funding for community-based archival projects with absolutely no one from the community being listed um, in the project staff, or at least being listed in a position of decision-making power. Um, I've definitely seen you know, them listing community consultants, um, which I generally don't think is sufficient because they're usually not compensated uh, fairly, and then they're in an advisory role, they're not in a decision-making role. So I think if institutions really are committed to doing this community-based work, um, that these community members should be listed on the grant as either principal investigators or co-principal investigators. Um, as I mentioned earlier, compensation was an issue that we had to think creatively about at UT, and we were able to find a solution for some of our partners, but um, compensation wasn't available to all of our partners. And unfortunately, TAVP was an example of that. Um, we were not able to monetarily compensate your staff for the labor that they did processing all the archival materials that were deposited at UT. And I think compensating partner labor needs to be a default within these partnerships, um, because without that compensation, the work either won't get done, or it won't get done completely, or it will be done slowly. And of course, all of this has long-term consequences for access. So again, if these large university libraries are serious about doing this post-custodial work and this community-based work, this compensation should be accounted for in actual budget lines for collection development or outreach. Um, this leads me to the issue of how to, of how institutions can engage in these ethical non-extractive relationships. Um, I do wanna stress the importance of compensation, but I don't want to imply that these partnerships should be purely transactional either. I think ethical, partnerships um, don't end when a financial transaction is complete, um, apart from this long-term commitment to the preservation of digital materials, there also needs to be investment in that relationship um, because this relationship will you know, really build the foundation for bolstering access and the use of collections, both within the community of origin, but also for a wider public, if that's what the community has decided. Um, I think large university libraries should not be hoarding opportunities to speak on this post-custodial partnership without actually including the partners, inviting them to be part of it. They also shouldn't be showing off these collections, as you mentioned, in pursuit of institutional clout chasing or fundraising um, without actually supporting or investing in the relationship, um, which it sounds like, unfortunately, UT did just that. Um, I don't think that investing in the relationship always has to be monetary either. I think it can be sharing or redistributing equipment, resources, other opportunities that the large institution has access to. And I think, you know, as you said, due to these ongoing histories of white supremacy, colonialism, there are so many reasons why community groups are wary of working with large institutions. And so if we continue to perpetuate these dynamics, um, in these supposed partnerships, um, it will ultimately prevent other valuable community archival materials from being preserved for the long term. Um, I think another common challenge that I've seen is that large institutions that receive grant funding to initiate these partnerships don't always have the sufficient staff to support them. So, um, or they don't have the appropriate expertise to staff the project. So it's imperative that archival staff really have the necessary cultural and or linguistics competencies to engage in these post-custodial partnerships, especially if they're working with indigenous, global south, or diaspora communities. Um, you know, English shouldn't be assumed as a default language in these partnerships, nor should these like Western archival principles be imposed on the collection if it doesn't, you know, work for the collection and, and serve the partnership. 
Um, I think additionally, if these large universities really want to grow their number of post-custodial partnerships, the number of staff supporting those par partnerships needs to be scaled accordingly. Um, and this isn't just with archivists, but also those who work in technical services, digital infrastructure, asset management. Um, you know, a lot of the presenters yesterday talked about this issue of contingent labor, which is really endemic in, in archival repositories and is detrimental to the work. And, you know, how can large archival institutions really ethically say that they're going to commit to the long-term preservation of materials when they have um, temporary positions such as digital assets coordinators? So I think by not addressing these staffing issues, community collections are really vulnerable to loss even before they arrive to an institution or they risk atrophying within the institution. Um, so I think many of these issues could actually be addressed if institutions engaged in sustainability planning before even applying to grant funding. Um, as you've discussed, and as I've witnessed, a lot of these post-custodial relationships really flounder after grant funding ends. And I think it's because institutions didn't adequately plan for sustainability in terms of funding for staffing and for investing in the relationship and the infrastructure. And, so, and even though they promise to have this long-term commitment to the partnership and to the preservation materials. So I think if this sustainability planning isn't in place before grant, before applying to grants, it's really unethical for institutions to engage with the partnerships um, because if they can't fulfill this pr promise of long-term stewardship. I think if an institution can't reasonably plan for sustainability, then it should plan for how to sunset a project after funding ends. And this really should be part of the initial conversation that they have with a community partner, because it will help inform the community um, and their consent process around whether or not they choose to engage in this partnership. Um, you know, when we started this work uh, close to 15 years ago, it was largely experimental. We were figuring a lot of things out. And I've always said that there is no one right way to do a post-custodial relationship, but I think we've learned how not to do it. And I think we really have the benefit of um, working over the past 10 years to how we can better ethically engage in these partnerships moving forward. Okay, so with, with all of that in mind, I mean, what would be your advice to uh, uh, community archives or even other groups um, activists or organizer groups that um, may be interested in engaging in the social partnership? Yeah, so I think my biggest piece of advice is to negotiate with the institution. Don't be afraid to negotiate um, for what the community wants, what's going to benefit the different stakeholders in the in the community. Um, I think if community materials require, you know, specific forms of access, that should be specified and requested up front. Um, I know the power dynamic between a large institution and a community group can be intimidating or daunting, but I think community groups really actually wield a lot of power because it's typically the large institution that's pursuing them to work together. Um, so with that said, I think it's really, you know, if they decide to engage with that partnership, it's really important to document the decisions and commitments. Um, as mentioned earlier, there can be a lot of staff turnover, you know, that results in loss of institutional memory. And I've, you know, had the experience of stepping into a partnership um, that's been going on for over 10 years. And, you know, various commitments were documented, but not all of them. And I've seen firsthand how a relationship can really suffer be when there are these unkept promises because staff members don't actually know what was promised before or what was said in the past. So I think having clear documentation around these commitments and decisions really um, sets the foundation for having a, a more successful partnership. Um, I know we're getting close to our time. So I wanna actually close out and pose that same question to you. What advice would you give to other community archives who are considering engaging in a post-custodial partnership? Well, first I would say never jeopardize your principles or ethics. Um, and as soon as your principles and ethics begin to be jeopardized, uh, maybe there's an opportunity to actually work uh, uh, with institutional partners to um, to learn from that, where they can evolve and grow. Um, but if they're unwilling to, to act, then I think you have to leave and cultivate a new partnerships with either another institution or I think increasingly with, with the new investment um, from institutional funders and community archives, I think increasingly community archives may be um, better positioned and have the capacity to actually engage in post facility partnerships themselves. So for example, um, our after violence archive has partner collections that we do many of the same 
um, levels of support that you all did for us in those early years. Um, and, you know, when we're considering any kind of a partnership with the institution, uh, we're pretty serious about first checking if uh, our principles and ethics of the project that we're considering partnering with are in balance. Um, and if they're not, again, we're determining whether there's an opportunity for that inst institutional partner to grow and evolve by basically learning from us and learning how we do our work um, in a way that's very community-centered, ethical, inclusive, et cetera. Second, um, I'd say to always remain vigilant and maybe even skeptical uh, of these partnerships. Um, but also to know that they can work and they can be effective and generative like ours was in those in those early years. Um, I'll also say that we've had a long time partnership with the UCLA Community Archives Lab and currently working with um, Michelle Caswell and Anna robinson Smith there. And that has been a very good um, and generative partnership over the last couple of years for us. And I think we'll continue to work with them. Uh, and then finally, I would say you know, to not ignore the the real threat of loss of the endangered knowledge that I mentioned before, the, the endangered knowledge of the communities that we serve, especially those that are directly impacted by state violence and systematic human rights uh, abuses, um, find ways to ethically and responsibly document, preserve, and when appropriate, make accessible these community stories and records, because fundamentally this memory work is essential for justice and liberation. So, there's obviously so much more to say about all of this, but I think we may be out of time, so I'll wrap it up there. Yeah, I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Gabe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we're we're ready for Q and A now. Yeah, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you so much, both of you. That was super interesting. Um, I was frantically taking notes here, and it seems like our attendees were too, because we already have a bunch of questions in the Q and A. Um, so I'll just remind everyone again. Um, it's best to put your questions into the Q&A. It's easier for us to monitor. Um, please don't raise your hands because we will not be calling on people to, um, to share um, with audio. So um, I'm going to go ahead and ask the first question here, which is, <clears throat> you've already spoken about this a little bit, uh, but what advice do you have for practitioners and academic institutions to put pressure on our resource allocators and decision makers to transform structures and budgets to sustain those post-custodial partnerships? Oh, yeah, this is, uh, I think, the eternal challenge that we're, we're faced with. I think one effective uh, strategy that, um, that we did it at UT Austin and also here at UCLA is really tying how the work supports the overall uh, missions of, of the university and the library. I think another thing that I learned in doing these partnerships is, you know, you may have an amazing post-custodial partner with an incredible collection that's super valuable for the historical record, but if you don't have people on campus who are going to actively engage with the collection, it's a lot harder for the institution to justify putting resources into that collection. And unfortunately, that's what we saw happen with the Genocide Archive of Rwanda, incredible, important collection, but no one at UT really worked in depth with Rwanda. And so we didn't have a lot of pressure that we could exert showing that it was gonna be worth the investment. So those were two strategies that I've seen work. Um, this is sort of a follow-up, I guess, um, but what forms of documentation do you think can help institutions plan for partnership sustainability, um, especially when staff turnover, as we've mentioned, is frequent, um, both in institutions themselves and in the community-based partners? Uh, um, this is something that I'm starting to think about a lot as well, because I've never worked in an institution that has done it. So, you know, I think, at UT Austin, they kind of plan for sustainability in the sense that when they hired me for the Human Rights Documentation Initiative, which was not grant, which was grant funded, my position was not grant funded. So I was going to be the one resource dedicated to it. I don't think that's sufficient, but I think, you know, finding what staffing lines can be dedicated um, to doing the partnerships is really important. And it's actually way more beneficial because then you're not having to rebuild a relationship, um, which actually would require more investment um, over the long term. Um, I think, you know, just 
I think every institution is going to be different, right? Because you're working in different contexts with different financial uh, situations. And so I think the main things that people have to, to think about, the questions they have to ask are around staffing, around, um, you know, storage capacity, you know, who do they identify as campus allies who will support the, the ongoing maintenance of this post-custodial relationship um, and have these conversations with different levels of the organization. I think it's really important to have your admin and resource allocators on board. This can't be something that happens in a silo in one department. Um, so making sure you have all the right people in the room having these conversations, I think is um, the best start you can have. Oh, thank you. Um, let's see, there are a bunch of other questions here. Um, we have another question that's asking, is there a guide or a checklist for community archives entering into partnerships with institutional collections? That is something that lists many of the issues that both Gabe and TK have described as potential pain points and pitfalls in impacting ethical practice and sustainability. Uh, I don't know uh, if there is one out there that exists, uh, but I will say what I do know is um, the closest to that that I do know of is the Architect and Sustainable Future Report. Um, uh, that emerged from that gathering in 2018. Uh, so again, I, if you haven't read it, people should read it. It's, it's a really important resource. The other thing that I'll mention is that TVP has been very involved um, in recent years with the, um, the, the creation of a community archives collaborative, which is a pure, a national and likely global uh, peer support network among community archives. And it's been, the pandemic sort of disrupted the momentum that we had in putting this collaborative together in, in after the, the ASF gathering. Um, but I'm glad to say that we host TVP hosted a gathering in Austin uh, in November of last year. And we had, I think, 60 representatives from community archives all around, um, all around the US and possibly some internationally as well. And the whole point is, of that collaborative is to create resources like this and to, um, to uh, be a, a network for knowledge sharing and skill sharing uh, around all, all of the various types of obstacles and barriers that community archives are facing. Um, so uh, so I, I would think that that collaborative, once it gets going, hopefully this year, later this year, uh, we'll be putting out and creating those exact kind of resources. Just to yeah, thank follow you so much, up on, on that, yeah, I ahead. think the publication that Gabe mentioned, the Architect and Sustainable Futures Report, um, would actually also be a really great thing to have as part of your conversation if you're talking about sustainability planning, because they highlight a lot of these uh, questions in that report. Thank you to you both. Um, so we actually have a question from our YouTube audience. Um, it seems that the impetus of a community wanting to maintain their identity and document document their collective memory is at odds with that of a large institution driven by research. How do you reconcile these or can you in the end? I mean, I think that's what we're trying to probably trying to figure out in having dialogues like this. Um, and again, I, there are people that I trust and respect greatly in the community archives field who don't think that that's possible because of their own experiences with institutional partnerships or just because these institutions are often so entrenched with white supremacy or, um, you know, um, problematic uh, practices within their communities that they just aren't interested in that. Um, and, I, you know, I am not quite there. Um, but again, I think it takes a lot of work um, and it will take a lot of work and uh, at all levels, but perhaps especially at the you know, leadership level within libraries and institutions. Um, so I, I don't have a quick and easy answer to that question. It's it's a, it's a hard one, but I think people are really trying to figure it out because it, they are important and um, will will continue to be necessary for a lot of community-based groups. I think. I'd like to say a follow-up for that. Um, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of instances where the institution, the goals of each partner isn't always going to align. And I do think there is space for finding, you know, what the common goals are. Um, you know, I think TAVP is actually a really good example of like, 
when they started working with HRDI, it was actually very beneficial for all parties who were involved. And then there came a time where it wasn't, and that's okay. Like that relationship can transition too. So I think being open to a different relationship possibilities um, and leveraging kind of the resources um, to, to a community archives advantage, you know, can be one, one way to go or one way to think about it. It doesn't have to be black or white. Um, I have one more question, I think. I think we have time for one more question um, that uh, I think is related to that. Um, if you if you believe your institution is applying or will apply unethical and extractive methods of partnerships, do you think it's worth pushing for change? And this person, I think, is speaking as someone who is, you know, a librarian or an archivist, not in a leadership role. Um, or should librarians try to work outside of the institution to support community-based archives in a different way? I think both. Um, I think there's a lot of literature now that you can share with your administration um, that shows, you know, here are different ways to approach these partnerships. Um, I, I, but, you know, sometimes administration isn't going to listen and they're going to do what they're going to do. I think if you're in a role to help maybe mitigate or maybe educate the community partner on what some of their options are in, in a partnership, I think that can be a strategy. Um, I think there's a lot of us who work within institutions and recognize the limitations and also try to contribute our expertise to these community initiatives outside. Um, I think um, the, what is it? The Archivist Supporting Activists um, initiative that the Documenting the Now project has is a really great example of that. Like tons of archival professionals have signed up on this list. And if there are activist groups who want some archival expertise, they can scan the list and reach out to someone. Um, so I think, you know, there's really a lot of space to address this issue from both within and outside the institution. Well, I think unless there are, I'm just going to make sure there's not any other questions that I'm missing. Um, but I think that that's about all that we have time for today. I wanted to thank you both again um, for sharing your expertise and your experiences with us. Um, and I hope that you will be able to stick around for the some of the panels at the end of the conference, because I think that you'll find um, I don't know. There's a lot of ways in which your talk today, I think, is going to be in dialogue with those papers. And I'm really interested to hear more. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass things off to uh, my colleague, Molly McGuire, who will be moderating the next session. And thanks again, TK and Gabe. Thank you.